went in to visit uh, Pat Trophy for the other day. I got in there with my Bible and I realized I didn't have my glasses. So I started in with the 23rd Psalm and I started quoting scripture. And I was just amazed how much I could come up with. <laughs> you can do what you have to do, you know? <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I had to look this one up. I couldn't coach this one. <laughs> From Ezekiel 37, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, O oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Why do I use that for a communion scripture? But aren't there a lot of folks in our community that are dead spiritually? And can the Lord make life come to those people? Absolutely. With just a little love and care, breathe life. He can breathe spiritual life into everyone and everything. You please pray for me. God, thank you for Jesus. And as we prepare our hearts today for Holy Communion, please help us to remember that Jesus died for the forgiveness of our sins mm -hmm. and rose again to give us new spiritual Amen. lives. Jesus took the bread, asked God to bless it. He broke it in two. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as often as we take the bread, as often as we drink of the cup, we remember Jesus' body and his blood given for us. This represents Jesus' body. Just a simple thing, a loaf of bread, something that everyone has, something that everyone can do. Bread, pure and simple, but symbolic of Jesus' body. We do this to remember Him. In the same way, when they had finished eating, He took the cup, asked God to bless it gave it to his disciples and said, Take, drink of this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. We have about 22 or 23 quarts of blood in our body. Without that, we can't live. And Jesus knew that. And he gave his blood for us. His blood was poured out taken away. His life was taken from him. But he did that willingly, knowing how many times we would forget that he was willing to die for us, give his life blood for us. But he asked us to stop and remember him. Remember what he did. Remember who he was. Remember what he represented.
for your glory and for the benefit of your kingdom. Let us remember to give freely and generously. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from Romans 3, 21 through 26. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because of his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. May God, may God add his blessing to the reading of this book. Amen. Thank you. Too many knees got thrown out. 
game got bigger and faster, and uh, we, we can't do that anymore. So the little guys like me just kind of have to run along beside and uh, try to grab a hold of them if we can slow them down a little bit. Do you like it when the rules change? Do you like it when the rules change? Oh, we don't like change. <laughs> you got to say this way, let's do it this way. We used to kick off the football from the 50-yard line. Then we moved it back to the 45, and now we're back at the 35, and they're still kicking it out of the end zone. Oh, well, we're going to have to do something about that because you just as well give the other team the ball on the 20 or 25 or whatever and uh, do away with that. What's wrong with rules? What's wrong with rules? What's wrong with having laws? Is it kind of amazing? Uh, we've been studying the Old Testament in Bible study, and God set down the rules for the Israelites to live by. Isn't it amazing how many of those rules we have in effect today that are, are very much our, our uh, social rules uh, are, are very much like those rules that were given? So where do we get our where do we get our idea of right and wrong, of what's good and what's bad? A lot of it comes from the Lord and it comes from the Ten Commandments, uh, it comes from the rules that God gave us to live by. Was there anything wrong with God's rules? Absolutely not. They were good. They were good. Uh, where do we get our morality? What is moral? What is morally right? What's morally wrong? We get it from what the, the Lord laid down for his people. If we back up to chapter 2, we find Paul talking to the Israelites. And he says, hey, Israelites, Jews, just because you're circumcised doesn't mean you're going to heaven, doesn't mean that you're okay, doesn't mean that you're forgiven. And just because somebody out here is not circumcised and is obeying all the rules and living by God's laws and doing the right thing doesn't mean they don't have a chance. And that comes as a shock to everyone because what advantages do the Jewish people have? Well, they have the, the rules. They have the law that was given to them. Uh, it was a gift to them, and they were God's chosen people for years and years. But now Paul says, hey, something bigger than that has happened. Something larger than that has happened. God has come. God has come for you. God has come because he loves you. God has come because he cares about you. And there's something else here. There's something else. If you have a child and you've laid down a bunch of rules and ways that they're supposed to live and rules that they're supposed to obey and they disobey those rules, what do you do? To them. Maybe you take away you know, some of their toys. Uh, maybe you take away some of their privileges. But you try to work with them and you try to bring them around and, and straighten them out. Is this what God is doing with us? Because the law was good. Is there anything wrong with the Ten Commandments? But it was us who was not good enough to keep the Ten Commandments. It was us who was failing. The people. We were failing. We could not keep the law. So what does God do? He comes to us. He says, hey, there is a righteousness that is beyond the law. And that righteousness is believing Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and not by his blood you are saved. Now, you should have heard that sermon many, many times. You should have heard that sermon a lot of times from every minister who has ever been here. Because it's the basis of our belief. 
is what we believe. And every time we come together, we should talk about it. And we should be reminded of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How was he resurrected? By the power of God and by the grace of God and the forgiveness of God. A young man was driving across the state of Alabama and he was in a hurry. He was trying to get to his parents because his father was sick. He was exceeding the speed limit. Roman pulled in behind him, stopped him, said, son, you were exceeding the speed limit by a lot. And he takes him into town and takes him into his office and says, your fine will be a thousand dollars. And the boy says, hey, I got about 35 bucks to get where my dad is. And I need to see him before he leaves me. The officer gets up, takes off his judge's robe, goes around, gives the boy a thousand dollars. He goes back, puts on his judge's uh, robe, and sits down and said, "Son, your fine is a thousand dollars. Do you have a thousand dollars?" And the boy says, "Yes, I do." And he pays him. That's a practical example of what God has done for us in Jesus. He gives us the payment. He gave that to us. He paid for our sins out of his own blood, out of his own pocket, out of his own love. He pays for our sins. Some scriptures come to mind to me. That I have to share with you, even though you may be well fed and don't want you going to sleep here. Proverbs 1 7 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah, I've shared that with you a lot of times. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But do we respect? God as we should? Do we give him everything he deserves every day, all the time? And during the ball game tonight, might we be thinking, <laughs> boy, if some of those guys would get hurt, it sure would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> That's getting really personal, isn't it? <laughs> But do we give God the respect that he deserves all the time? He is our creator. He is who made us. We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. He didn't have to come to us and say, I love you and I want you. He could have said, you know, this didn't work. Let's try again someplace else. But he didn't. He didn't. He loved the world so much. And who is the world? You and I. We are the world. And he loves us that much. And can he be with us on a personal lover as, as we are an only child? Now that's beyond us. We don't understand it. But it is possible. God is spirit. He can be with us as an only child all the time, constantly. It's Rhea giving God the respect that he deserves. After I became a pastor and looked back across all the different occupations that I had had, and I had had many on my road, but understanding God and understanding people, I knew I could go back and do every job that I ever had better than I did when I was there. The 
fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning. That's the start. That's the start. <clears throat> first John, the first chapter, says God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. Can you imagine something that is pure love? Something that is pure love. Can we imagine that? Don't we put conditions on love so many times? If you do this, I will love you. If you act this way, I will love you. If you give me this, I will love you. If you would go do that for me, I would love you. Pure love. God is love. This is love. Jump over to the fourth chapter. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. Have we ever loved anything that didn't love us back? Wouldn't that be a tragedy to love something and have it not return that love to us? 1 Corinthians 13 says, if I can get up here and give you a message that you just absolutely can't keep for yourself that you just have to go tell somebody else about that you're just so excited about you can't wait to get out that door and spread the word to everyone and you're just shocked that you don't have love and nothing it makes no difference and if you sell everything you have and give it to the poor and give up your body to research and give everything you have away, but you don't do it for love, it means nothing. How do we come around to that kind of, and that depth of love? How do we come to that depth of love? Matthew 7, 7 says, Seek and you will find. Ask and will be given. Knock and the door will be opened to you. I believe we have to seek that out. We have to want it. That is something we have to desire and have to want and have to go after. And why should we? Why should we? Well, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, life and no one comes to the Father but by me and to me that means Jesus is life and the more we change ourselves to be like Jesus the better life we have and I find that played out in my own life third chapter of the Gospel of John Jesus told Nicodemus you must be born again you must be born again. You must become a new creation. We thought, okay, okay, I can do that. But can we really, can we really become an absolutely new person, completely different? Turning our ideas, turning our uh, uh, priorities uh, completely around? Shifting everything from the love of this earth to the love of God and the principles of Jesus Christ? Can we do that? Jesus said you have to do that to enter the kingdom of heaven. So it is extremely important that we work toward that. Ask and will be given. Seek and you shall find. We have to go after that. 
We have to go look for it. We have to want it. God came for us. God came for us. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and came for us. If we were stranded on a desert island by ourselves, nobody around, nobody to talk to, and someone came and said, hey, can we help you? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Or if we were lost in the middle of the mountains and a search team found us, wouldn't that be a huge relief? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for loving us so much that you wouldn't let us go our own ways. You came for us and you delivered us. And you brought us back into the fold by your power. The power of your love and the body and the blood of Jesus was not a simple thing, was not inexpensive. It came at a terrible cost. All we can do is say thank you. All we can do is seek you. All we can do is try to live the life that you ask us to. To know more of you, to take more of you into our spirit. We thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you. Got any energy left?
only had three. I thought we only did three. Don't be curved here. Hey, good to have you all. Uh, thanks for being here. And uh, we praise the Lord for his love and his gracious and his goodness. Uh, we draw strength from each other. Uh, thank you, each and every one. Thank you, Lord, to be with us till we meet again. In Jesus, our Savior's name, amen. Thank you, Lord.